So afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to a session on discussing about building mailing software experiences. Um, my name is Narain Shanbag. Um, I think uh, Luke already introduced what I do. Um, I'm very passionate about design, and I'm going to discuss a few things with you which I believe leads to building amazing software experiences. So we're going to cover a few things today. Um, we're going to cover a, a small session on what design really is, uh, according to a few people's definition, and then according to mine. Um, we're going to cover uh, some things about myths, uh, because there's a lot of misconceptions about design as a whole. Uh, what it is, because some people think it's visual, some people think it's something else, some people think it's just problem solving. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, we're going to go into, into the psychology of design, just a little bit. And then uh, we're going to discuss a few key principles for building amazing experiences. So first section is on design, what it really is. Steve Jobs mentioned this revolutionary uh, idea that design is not just what something looks like and what it feels like, it's how things work. All right. Um, if you think about this, design has a, the most common misconception people have is the moment you talk about design, it's visual design, right? How things look like. Um, but if you really dig into it, if you did not have a good experience using your product, not just looking at your product, using your product, it turns out to be a very poor experience. So experience encompasses everything. It's not just how it looks like. That's one thing. This is how to take on design, by the way. One of them is design is the art of solving problems, which is also true if you think about it. Uh, when, when the user uses a product, it's usually because they have a problem and they want to use the product to solve the problem. Right? So the user always has a good experience provided the problem is solved. If not, it's not a good experience. But my take on it is good design is the art of solving problems with elegance. It's not just that the user uses the product, but at the end of the experience, they're happy. They're happy because they use the product. So without elegance, it's never considered to be great design. That's at least my take on it. OK. Just to give you an example of what I consider really good design, um, I want to talk about Airbnb. I want to show you just a quick set of screens of how you can go from scratch to booking a room using Airbnb. Before Airbnb, before this, I think it was roughly about 2008, and Airbnb became popular. And one of the reasons it became popular is because it came up during the time of recession. People wanted to make some quick money, and um, it just so happened that the, one of the easiest ways to make quick money is if you have a room to spare, which you want, which you don't mind renting out to somebody else. So Airbnb came about at a time when it was uh, most likely to succeed. But having said that, before Airbnb, if you remember, if you tried to book a room, it was a very clunky experience. If you had a huge page, uh, and the page was so messy, you, you'd be hard pressed to find where exactly you're supposed to click first and go to the next step and the next step after that. But Airbnb simplified this experience quite a bit. So let's take a look. If I open up my Airbnb app, I'm faced with a screen where I have only one place where I can click. If not, I can actually browse across to the bottom, but there's only one place I can click to find something, right? So I want to go to Sydney, I want to book a room over there. So I click on the place on top over there, and I have Sydney, and it gives me a bunch of options. I click on the most likely option, which I'll leave, and then after that, I'm faced with uh, two sections. One is exploring, in case I really have no idea where I'm going. And the second is where I can stay when I reach when I, when I go to reach Sydney. And I choose one of these options. And it takes me to a bunch of uh, content about uh, the place itself. But observe one thing. It has this nice button over here, which we call as a call to action button. If I was to advise my mom on using Airbnb, all I would tell her was, follow the purple button. It's as simple as that. So she scrolls through this page over here. If she likes it, she just follows the purple button. We'll come back to the purple button in a bit. All right? And the moment that's done, I click check availability, and it takes me to this page. And I can see 27th and 28th is free, which is where I want to go. So I select those two dates. And again, you see the purple button. I click save, and my experience is complete. In just a matter of six steps, I go from scratch to booking a room. How easy is that? So this is my this is my area of very elegant experience of going from scratch to solving the problem that I had, which was room bookings. Next, let's talk a little bit about myths of design. First thing, design is making things look pretty. 
Um, if anyone have, has any doubts that this is a myth, please ask someone who designed Windows 8. <laughs> All right. It looks really pretty. Think about it. It looks very flashy, and it's aimed at the millennial generation who basically like bright colors, shiny things that move around. But according to me, this was this had um, a lot of things that lacked the ingredients for a good experience. This is one. Second thing, its spiritual ancestor, which was Zoom. We all know how that turned out. Next was the Newton pad. Just before Steve Jobs came back to Apple. Apple bet a huge portion of their company on this one device, the Newton Pad, which again spectacularly failed. And the last one was Amazon's Fire Phone, which it was so sure would be a success. So what went wrong? Let's take a look. Number one, this is what the Windows screen looked like, right? Windows 8 screen. One thing Microsoft missed out on, which David Pogue from the, from the New York Times and from the Yahoo Tech column pointed out, was it was two experiences melded into one. One was the tablet experience, and second was the desktop experience. So supposing I used any Windows application like the Explorer or the Upgrade Assistant, I clicked on it, it tore me away from this experience, which was the tablet experience, and put me back inside the desktop experience, which felt for a lot of people like they have come from a different world and landed in a different world. And think about this. I'm in this world right now. How do I get back? I'm supposed to imagine at the bottom left hand corner, there is a Windows button over there which doesn't even exist. So, I mean, I don't know who signed up on that. Next, Zoom. With Zoom, we have two problems. Number one, it was the definition of experience. When, I, when Apple released the iPod in 2001, it had defined the music experience altogether. From that point on, that became the benchmark. So, if anyone wanted a music player, the benchmark was Apple's iPod. So they tried to change the way music was played, but by the time they did it, it was way too late. Second thing was product differentiation. If you're building an amazing product experience, you need to be able to differentiate from your competition. If you look exactly like your competition and try to emulate exactly what they do, despite not doing it in the same experience as they have done it, it does not turn out to be an ideal experience. Next, we have the Newton pad. This was an amazing invention for its time. But having said that, the single thing it lacked was the user experience. Now, all of us have used iPhones and smartphones, right? You know how icons should look like, how they should be spaced, and how much you can take in at any one screen. Take a look at this. Isn't that way too much to take in just for one screen? And to top it all, the key feature of this product was handwriting recognition, which did not work all the time. So Apple releasing a product that does not work all the time doesn't sound like Apple. Um, and to top this off, it cost $6.99 during its release, which worked out to be a very expensive product. Back then, $6.99 was like way too much. Adjusted for inflation, that's roughly about, I think, 1,000, 200,000 frames a day for a device that works sometimes. All right, next. Um, has anyone heard of Amazon's key feature called dynamic perspective before? Good, you didn't miss out on anything. Um, this is what we call as parallax effect today. If you have an iPhone or an iPad, a modern with a modern version that is uh, iPhone um, seven and above, if I'm not mistaken, you can observe one thing. You can hold a screen against you, and you can try moving around, and the screen moves with you. It's called the parallax effect. Sometimes it supposedly makes people feel a little giddy and nauseous, All right? Um, but they sold that as a key feature. Can you believe that? It, some, the feature makes a lot of people nauseous, and they sold that as a key feature. Uh, so not a good start right away. And the second feature was called Firefly. No, not that one. Yeah. All right, that one. Okay. Uh, this feature was supposedly aimed at people to get them to shop more because that's Amazon's key uh, value proposition, right? They actually sell stuff. So uh, you aim this at any product, it will tell you where you could shop it online. That will be on an Amazon store. I'm just joking. Always on an Amazon store. Um, but then that's not how people shop. When you go shopping, it's an emotional experience for a lot of us. So you love the experience of going to a shop, browsing as much as you need to, picking up stuff that you're really passionate about, having a play around, and then you purchase it, right? They miss, that full, they miss the whole point of that kind of shopping experience, which this did not emulate. So that was that. Next one, myth. More choice always makes for a better experience. I mean, it's true, right? I'm just joking. You can take a look at yourself. That was my TV, that was my TV remote when I first purchased my TV. You wouldn't believe it. It took me about uh, at least two minutes to figure out what I'm supposed to click first. 
Um, I mean, it's a pretty standard remote, but then I purchased Amazon Prime and I bought one of their Fire Sticks and I got this remote along with it. And ever since then, I just use Amazon Prime, nothing else. I'm just joking, but I love that remote. Um, yeah. Now, you think that people have learned their lesson in real life. Like, I mean, they see a remote and it doesn't look good, it's got too many options. So maybe when they emulate it in the software, it looks different? No. Definitely not. I mean, who uses these buttons? Has anyone used any of these buttons besides the standard navigate to each other, uh, sorry, to, to each channel and just click enter? I don't think so. But then life imitates art. Okay, next. There is this amazing law called the Higgs law. I don't know how many, uh, how many of us have heard of it, but it's a very beautiful law. It applies uh, to real life as much as it does to user experience design. It says the time it takes to make a decision increases with the number and the complexity of choices. So that's the reason why it's much easier to go to an um, ice cream parlor which serves just three uh, ice cream choices as opposed to something that chooses 50. If you have 50 choices, just imagine how much time it will take for you to make up your mind. Three is much more easier. So people prefer the first one rather than the second one. So that's that. And then UI and UX are the same. I once went for this interview which said UX designer. And I was very passionate about design, so I went to this interview, I had a huge chat with the person, um, and the person said, uh, do you know how to use Sketch, uh, Photoshop, Adobe suite of products, and so on. And I was like, um, I'm, just, I'm just clarifying one thing, is this a UI role or is this a UX role? And the person opposite to me asked me, what's the difference? I, I never followed back up there. Uh, <laughs> but the fact is, it's two different things, and we're going to talk about that in a second. But before I do, I want to recommend this course on this uh, awesome MOOC platform called Udacity. Uh, it, the course name is UX Design for Developers. Uh, for anyone passionate about design, you'd love that course. So what is UX? UX is a combination of three things. One is interface, second is engineering, and third is interaction. Just to give you an example of what makes up a good user experience, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about Google Maps. Take a look at it. Um, if I open up the application, that's what it looks like. Okay, And just like in the case of Airbnb, you have exactly one option. And just like Airbnb it had the purple button, over here you have the blue button. If I need to tell my mom, who's not a tech-savvy person, how she should use Google Maps, I just have to time step over there and press the blue button over here and follow where it goes. Just the blue button. So next thing, I just type the address of this place over here. Uh, again, give me the blue button at the bottom over there. It asks me my, st my starting point, which I can choose my current location, which is where I came from today. Um, and then it gives me a little preview. It's as simple as that. All through the process, exactly the same thing. Click the blue button. Now, I'll ask you a few questions about this. If the interface was not intuitive, would you be able to use this application? If it wasn't evident that I'm supposed to type my address over here, would you use this application? I'm guessing not. Second thing, if the information that I provided was not correct, would you still use this application, even though it's, uh, it's good looking? Of course you wouldn't. So, and the third thing, how to move from one screen to the next, that's basically the interaction. If that was not intuitive, would you use it? So the three ingredients which we need to make a good experience is interface, engineering, and interaction. That is what is a good user experience. Yeah, that's the last one. Awesome. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. Yeah. Here's something that's not a good user interface. I just want to make. I just want to clarify this point as well. So I was on Google Maps. I want to actually chart the route over here. And I want to avoid tolls. That was my use case. In Google Maps, it was very clear. I click on that part over there. It says settings. It comes over here, and, and I, get, I get to check this box, which clearly says avoid tolls, and I say I'm done. And then it says avoiding tolls. Right. This is on a little ma mapping application which shall not be named. Um, and it will be the root preferences and it says tools, checkbox. And I'm not sure if I should check it or I should not. If I check it, does it mean it's going to include tools? I'm not entirely sure about that. So, again, uh, differences between good UX and uh, good UI. Okay, next. The product came to represent the user base. I've seen a lot of people take this shortcut. Um, you have developed a good product, okay? And what you want to do is, you want to make sure it's well tested before it's released into the market. 
But user testing takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort. So what do we do? We have a product team. We are users as well. We can be users. Why can't we be users? So we start using it. We start testing with the product team. But there are two products. There are two problems for that. But before I get to that, I want to mention this important quote. One of usability's most hard learned lessons, hard learned lesson, is that you are not the user. That's by Jacob Nielsen, one of the pioneers in UX. Okay, and the two problems are one, we are product people. We love products. That's why we are a part of the product team. Since we love them so much and we are part of building them, they are our baby. Would anyone tell their baby they're ugly? Obviously not. Right? So it is never going to look bad for us. It's never going to look unintuitive for us because simply because we have built the product ourselves. Second thing is we've used the product. Even if we didn't build it, we have used the product before we start testing the product. So we know all the pathways. We know how to get from scratch to one use case or the second use case. So that's a second reason why we just can't be a part of testing the product. A good example of people who did not heed this was Google when they built Google Bus. Have you heard of this product, Google Bus? Awesome, awesome. At least, some, at least someone's heard of it. I'm happy about that. Um, but Google, by the way, Google Bus was an amazing product. It was a social networking site which predated Google Plus. Uh, so it was the ancestor of Google Plus, which eventually evolved into a different social network. But then 2010, when Google released Google Bus, they had tested it out with Google employees. 20,000 Google employees tested Google Bus, and they had very positive reviews. There's just one problem. It was not the intended audience. The intended audience was everybody, all of us. Just like Facebook, it was the whole world. So um, suffice to say, it didn't pan out very well. So within one year, the product was shuttered. And the final myth of the day, users know best. So Henry Ford once mentioned, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. So you know, if you ask a user, it doesn't always mean that they will know what they want. Steve Jobs, in fact, made this his philosophy. So what he mentioned was, you get the you get the requirements from the user, but you design the product, you build the product, you conceptualize the product, and that's how you build great products. And a prime example of this was the original iPhone. See, at that time, if you if you had asked users what they wanted, they would have said a better keyboard, a, a better physical keyboard. But nobody would envision that you could actually remove the keyboard altogether and just have one flat screen with one single button at the bottom over there. That users would not be able to even imagine that's possible. So the best thing to do is to actually conceive the product ourselves rather than asking somebody else's opinion uh, as to what the product should be. All right. Next. How people think. The psychology behind uh, building great products. First thing. Performance load. Um, there are two kinds of loads people face when they start using products. One of them is called sorry about that, cognitive load. If you remember, does anybody remember MS DOS over here? DOS, right? It was amazing. It was a 16 bit operating system that rarely ever crashed. It didn't crash simply because well, it was not multitasking or single tasking to start with. And uh, well, whatever it, whatever it was supposed to do, it did very well. But the problem was you needed to remember a lot of commands. So it put them out of the reach of, put the product out of the reach of many customers. Then came the second type of user interface, which is, which is called what you see is what you get. The benefit of this was it had very little cognitive load, which is why it had mass market appeal. Apple started using this uh, just for the sake of mass market appeal. And eventually Windows realized this is the way things are going to be done in the future. And then Windows 3.1 came out, Windows 95 came out, and that became the future of computing. It's called it load. Second thing is called kinematic load, uh, which essentially is physical effort. Yes. And a great example of this is OTA technology. Uh, I think about 10 years back, when you needed to upgrade your device, your mobile device, 10 years back, yeah, roughly 10 years back, when you needed to upgrade your device, what you needed to do was you connect it to your computer, and have some software like iTunes upgrade it for you. But the problem was it took a lot of effort, and people didn't want that. So a lot of people didn't even bother upgrading their devices. And that was a problem for both Apple and for Google. So they wanted people to be more secure uh, with the devices. So they wanted people to upgrade as much as possible, which is when they came up with this amazing technology called OTA technology. With this technology, all you do is you just get an update on your phone. You click update. It downloads the update. You're done. That's it. Easy as that. So that reduced the physical effort, which is, again, something which we want to do in our product experiences. 
Um, there are some exceptions to this rule, however. One, supposing you go to a gym, you want to exert physical, right? That's the whole point. It's the same way in software as well. Supposing you want to learn touch typing, what do you do? You actually exert. So you, you should not have an option like, for instance, um, use Siri to just dictate your notes. That doesn't make any sense because you're supposed to be actually putting some effort over there. All right, next. Habituation. Uh, this is an amazing talk by Tony Padel. I've actually left the link over there at the bottom, um, which talks about habituation. Um, sorry, yeah. A long time ago, when devices became smart, you had Wi-Fi and you had mobile data. But the problem was you needed to switch between the two yourself, right? So uh, you have a good Wi-Fi network. Oh yeah, I think I know there's a Wi-Fi network over here which is secure and I have a password for that. I need to switch it on manually. And the moment you don't have it, you need to go back and switch the mobile data on manually. That was a bit of a hassle, but the thing is people got used to it. If you, obviously, if you think about it, right? A long time back, people would just get used to these things, but today they expect things to be smart, which is exactly what's happened. So the moment you now come close to a Wi-Fi uh, hotspot, which uh, Wi-Fi network which you have a uh, uh, password for and which is secure, you automatically switch to that for mobile data, even though you have the mobile data on. But the thing is, as product designers, we need to know this. We can't get used to it. The users might get used to switching manually between the two, but as product designers, we cannot afford to, it, afford to do that. So that's what Tony Patel said in his talk. Third thing is the state of flow. Uh, there was this psychologist called Mihai Chiksa Mihai. I think I've gotten the pronunciation correctly, hopefully. Um, but what he meant, what he said was, uh, when he talked to artists, when he talked to sports people, they had this amazing state of concentration when they were doing their craft. Nothing could distract them. For hours together, uh, they would keep doing their craft and they would not even get tired, they would not get exhausted. And he wanted to know if you can replicate that in different experiences. So. In, in a product experience, we can do the exact same thing. We can replicate the state of mind. Oops, sorry. We can replicate the state of mind. Provided we have three things. One is we need to have a clear goal. Second is we need to have feedback, immediate feedback. And the third is we need to have balance between uh, challenge and skill. So if we have these three things, we can replicate the exact same thing in product experiences. A simple example of this is games. Um, I, I was in love with this uh, awesome game called Warcraft. Uh, eventually, it became Dota, and I would play for hours together because I had just these three things. I knew exactly what I was supposed to do, uh, and the moment I started a campaign, for instance, it would give me immediate feedback. Okay, and uh, it was a perfect balance for me between my challenge uh, and the skill required to actually accomplish that game. So, in game design, this is actually very, very uh, appropriate. And the fourth thing is intense focus. So the thing is, uh, as far as flow is concerned, you need to maintain a balance between two things, challenge and skill like we discussed. If the game is too challenging, it leads, sorry, if the game is not too challenging, it leads to boredom. If the game is too challenging, it leads to anxiety. And we need to find middle way between the two. Um, so yeah, and like I said, the fourth thing is focus. The moment you enter a state of flow, according to Mihai Chicks of Mihai, you enter a state of intense focus. If our product can be designed around intense focus, this is going to be amazing for a product experience. A good example of this is this amazing <coughs> application which I've used called Calmly Writer. Um, so Calmly Writer has just this one section where you can type your content. That's it. You just type your content, and the moment you want to make a change, you select something, and it gives you the options. So actually, uh, either highlight it in bold or have any other formatting you've done on it. So it takes the distraction away, and all you see is your content, you and the content and nothing else. So that's a way we can actually bring focus into our products as well. Again, it creates an amazing experience. In fact, this minimalistic experience is what we love about products like Apple, uh, which, of course, Google has adopted as well these days. Next. The last section is building great experiences. A few great tips. Um, yes. So. When one of my friends actually moved over to the Apple ecosystem back about seven, eight years back, because back then we were all PC people, and we'd have this joke about Apple people that they like it too easy. Um, so he moved over to the Apple ecosystem, and we asked him, like, what's it like? And he said, like, it's amazing. It's so well thought out of. You know, and we asked him, what is it that you specifically like about it? He said, I'll give you an example. Um, I can open up my MacBook Air with one hand. 
we just laughed about it. Like, what's the big deal about that? And then all of a sudden, what happened was um, we started thinking about this. Like, is it really that important? And after some time, uh, I had a phone call. And I needed to open up my laptop and give some information uh, to the other person. And I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't. I struggled. So I was like like that, and I was like, trying to just open it up a lot. Uh, it, it, I just realized it's something so small, but yet it's something so profound. Um, so yes, little things do matter. Okay. Um, and in the software space, Google really took this principle to heart. In 2003-2004, a lot of people had email, but they had this one really terrible experience about email, and that was storage. So if you remember back then, 200 MB was the height of good storage, 200, 250 MB. And I remember my dad having this uh, really bad uh, case where he would just sit around uh, 20 minutes a day or 30 minutes a day and he just uh, keep deleting email. I just said, what are you doing? He said, like this 20 to 20 minutes is just for deleting email so that I don't run out of space. Uh, and well, enter Gmail. And what happened was when they launched, they launched with one GB of space. And within a year, it became two GB. And within about 2012, it became 10 GB. And initially, just to make sure that uh, you know people understand what the real selling point is, they remove the delete button altogether. So they have delete button just to highlight to people what exactly is the selling point of uh, of Gmail. And it, uh, it didn't end there. It realized that people what they sorry what people really do is they have conversations. So I don't know if you remember email from 15 years ago, but it did not have this feature called conversations at all. So if you send an email and you got an email from someone someone back, it would be as a separate email. You have to click on that and just you have to look down like what was it that I said that this person responded to? But Gmail started clubbing it in the form of conversations, which was pretty amazing. So yeah, that's the second point. Uh, next, the stoic philosophy of minimalism. When Steve Jobs returned in 1997, um, he said in his own words, he found the company in dire straits. Okay, and uh, what he mentioned was it was 90 days away from bankruptcy, and he had to do something. Uh, just to save the company and fast forward to today. It's one of the most valuable companies in the world and what he mentioned He did was there were about hundreds of products that Apple was working on He stripped all the hundred away and just narrowed it down to four or five products Which a lot of engineers could focus on and build much better experiences and that's basically the, uh, the principle of minimalism um, We can also apply this to singular products um, Steve Jobs mentioned that selection of technology in products is also important in his talk in All Things Steam, he mentioned Apple tries to accurately choose the right horses to ride, the technologies which are in their ascendancy, so which is why he did not include Flash in the original iPad, because he felt that the technology was not in its ascendancy, it was actually dragging down. It's the same thing with us as well. When we're when we looking at technologies, it's best to take a look at technologies which are in their ascendancy and then only use that and work on them in our products. So, um, as we remember in the previous cases, too much choices is not good. Minimalism again covers that as well. If you remember Office 2007, which was the newer iteration of Office, which they created a new UI for, this was the new ribbon interface. It was revolutionary simply because it did not have any menus. Um, so it looked good, which is a good thing. But again, take a look at that and please tell me honestly, how many of those have you really used? How many of those choices have you really used? Uh, I can tell you by experience maybe about four or five at max. Um, Microsoft realized this. Even even though eventually they had the same ribbon, they still simplify it. So those this was the 2000 sorry I think it's 2016 Office ribbon, and this was the one that's basically the release uh, in their iteration. So that that ribbon has been very useful. So the less of the choices uh, you have and show to your users, it it gives for a, it makes for a much better experience. Next, nobody wants to use your product. This is something no one wants to hear, but it's true. Uh, there was this amazing article on Smashing Magazine, which I've actually included the link to over there, um, which talks about the fact that a product is a means to an end. It's not an end on its own, it's a means to an end. When I got my first smartphone, it was pretty much all I could think about and all I could talk about. Um, yes, I'm a nerd, your day is charged. Um, but it was an amazing invention and its time. For the first time, I could listen to YouTube on the go. I could listen to music, uh, download as uh, as many apps as I wanted to. There was the new concept called App Store, which was amazing. However, after a few months, the novelty wore off, and I started realizing when I need to make a call, I'll use a phone. When I really need to watch a video, I'll, I'll use a phone. But I wouldn't just take it out anytime and just play around with it. Um, and that's exactly how people think of products. A product is nothing more than a means to an end. So 
the article pretty much says the same thing. Nobody really wants to use your product. Your product is simply a means to an end. A great example of this implemented in uh, software and in hardware is Touch ID. So think about it. Before Touch ID, how many of you really enjoyed putting a pin in there? You unlock your phone. How much? I mean, if, you, if there was a better way to do it, you would love to do it. After Touch ID came by, I could never go back. I could never go back. Um, and a similar thing has been introduced by Google in their uh, Gmail feature for Smart Compose. So all I need to do is open up a Compose window and start typing. And it predicts using machine learning what I most probably will say. So that way, I could just get on composing my email, finish it, and move on to my other tasks. Makes things much easier. So God bless such designers. Um, so yeah, I actually uh, like thinking of this as a term called just enough usage. Um, I totally made that up. All right. So next thing. Sometimes the answer is a new paradigm. Um, around early 2000s, uh, Microsoft got the whiff, uh, got, got a whiff that people are actually working on new form factors such as tablet PCs. And they wanted to be first to market. So they started working on tablet PCs. And that's what it looked like. Can you believe that? that, that that's as clunky as it gets. You know, and they thought, okay, fine, the default way of interacting with the tablet is we are stylus and let's use a stylus and let's use the exact same operating system, which is Windows XP. You can see that that's Windows XP over there, just in a, you know, port rate mode. But it just didn't work. They tried it multiple times in multiple form factors, it just didn't work. Apple, on the other hand, went a different route and it just worked because they were looking at the problem probably the wrong way. Sometimes the answer is a new paradigm. You need to think of things in a new way if you're really looking to build amazing experiences. Um, just take a few steps back, see if there's a different way of think, different way things can be done, and probably you'll be surprised. Next, the pre-usage experience. Um, a lot of people actually have begun to understand that the experience of a product does not start when they use the product, when users use the product. Instead, it starts much before, sometimes even during the purchase period. Right, so, oh, sorry about that. Yeah, sorry. In 2013, one of my managers, uh, I remember, came to work a little later than usual, um, and he had this amazing smile on his face because he had got his brand new iPhone 6, uh, and he was so happy about it, and um, he just couldn't wait it again. And one of my colleagues told him, "Is that a good idea? You just open up the phone, and you're just using it right now. You don't even have a case." And he said, "No, I, I couldn't be bothered. You know, I'll, I'll probably place an order probably later, and you know, we get a case in a week's time." And by the end of that day, the, the smile turned into a frown because the, the phone was back in the box and when we opened it up, there was a huge, huge crack on it. And um, he went back to uh, Apple and he just got replaced and it cost him $350. Not a good experience to start with. Um, the colleague who recommended it to him, by the way, even he didn't have a great experience. Because what happened was, um, he loved using a, a phone or a tablet device only after he got the case. So when he purchased the product, he would order the case, and it would take about a few days to come. Sometimes they wouldn't synchronize. He would have the product person which he couldn't use. He had a case which he had no use for. So uh, after some time, the same colleague ordered a OnePlus 5T. Okay? Uh, I know this by experience because I have one too. And what I loved about this myself is I placed an order for this product, I received it, and the moment I opened the box, to my surprise, it had, a, it had a screen protector and a case to go along with it. All I needed to do was just slap a SIM, SIM card inside, turn it up, and that's it. I could just use it. So OnePlus looked at the experience right from the shop end, but right from the shopping part of it, all the way till I received the product, and I used the product. It was an amazing experience, which is why I recommend OnePlus many times to my fans. Um, and no, they haven't paid me for this. Okay, next, the post-usage experience. Um, <clears throat> sorry. But taking a look at the pre-usage experience, let's take a look at the post-usage experience. So potential customers, what they do is they walk into a store, browse sections until something piques their interest, okay, uh, place it in their shopping cart, and then they check out. It's exactly the same in an online store as well. There's no difference at all. So this is the process. A lot of attention is therefore paid to the store itself because they want you to they want to get you to purchase a product, but they don't they're not particularly bothered what happens after you use the product. A lot of stores are saying. Um, <clears throat> if you take a look at 
stuff like productreviews.com or Google Play stores, you will see certain reviews which pretty much say the exact same thing. They cared about us till we purchased the product, but the moment we purchased the product, they say we don't know who you are. Um, this is something that can be taken care of because once you enter into, so once a customer purchases a product from you, it is actually a relationship. They will come back to you again and again simply because they've had great experience not just purchasing the product, but having a good relationship with you because you've been giving them good services after they purchase the product. According to a Harvard Business Review article, uh, it says 16% of the companies looked to retain customers. This is despite the fact that to acquire a new customer costs five times more. So it would make sense, right, to actually retain customers rather than look for new customers. Uh, and a good example of a company that takes care of retaining its customers is a company called Sitor, uh, sorry, uh, Sephora. Sephora, that's right, sorry about that. Um, yes, and what's amazing about them is they take care of every part of the customer journey. Um, the first thing is they have something called a beauty workshop as soon as you purchase a product from them. So you purchase something from them, you don't know what to do with it, they have a workshop to train you in, in you know, using it to, uh, to its best potential. So next, they have a mobile application where before you purchase something, you can actually check it out how it look like. So you know exactly what you're looking for when you actually enter a store and make a purchase or you know, use their mobile app to make a purchase. And the next thing is after you made a purchase, there is a tracking feature. So if you may purchase from their mobile application, there's a tracking feature which tells you exactly what stage your delivery is on, uh, which is again pretty amazing, since it's a part of the application and not as part, not part of a separate application like uh, from Australia Post. Um, and any additional helpful content, any additional helpful content is sent to you during delivery. So when it is being delivered to you, if there's something that will help you make better use of the product, they send it to you so that while you're waiting, uh, you still have something to work with which is amazing, end-to-end. -end. They've taken care of end-to-end, -end, uh, all the way from the beginning of the shopping experience all the way to the end. So yes, all this results in an amazing experience, uh, simply because the moment you take care of the customer, the customer becomes your unofficial brand ambassador, and they recommend it to other customers as well. Next, being ubiquitous. Um, I'll just wrap up after this. Uh, so being ubiquitous. There was a running joke amongst my friend circle. There are three things that are ubiquitous in this world. Uh, one is air, second is media, and third is Netflix. Because they're pretty much everywhere. You pick a platform, they're just there. You know, Apple TV, Chromecast, uh, smart TV. No, no. That's smart TV. Um, Playstations, set-up boxes, phones, laptops, you name it. You have uh, amazing you have an amazing coverage filled with Netflix. So, um, how much time do we have, sorry? Um, we're just about out of time, so we probably have to wrap it up. Thank you so much, yeah. Um, so yeah, so for a minute, and it's not just the fact that they're present on the platform, they, they're integrated with the platform. Supposing you're on iTunes, supposing you're on Apple TV, you can make a purchase of a subscription using iTunes, which is pretty amazing. You don't have to go off to their website and do it. Um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of people have picked that up right now, but back then when they started out, uh, Netflix was the only one covering this, and it was it was pretty amazing. Um, yes, and if you're watching something on during commute, uh, you're watching it on your phone, immediately you can cast it the moment you reach your home, you can cast it on your TV, which is again amazing, they covered that as well. Because simply because Netflix was on your phone, it was on your TV as well, it made it super easy for them to just quickly cast uh, the same thing over there. Um, and yes, the last thing was consistency. Netflix looked the same no matter which platform you were on. So here's how Netflix looked like on my phone, and here's how it looked like uh, on my iPad Pro. So if, if I start, um, so if I, if I move from my phone all the way to my tablet, I know exactly where I am and how, how, I, how I actually move around. So yes, the last thing is consistency. Um, and speaking of ubiquity, uh, another, app, uh, another great example of this was Microsoft OneNote. The moment I asked my friend, what is, the, what is, the, what is your most favorite note-taking note, note -taking application? The one thing they told me was Microsoft OneNote and you don't need to look any further. The simple reason is because what other platform can support a watch? Because you never know when you need to take a note, right? So supposing you're out, you're, you're out someplace, you want to quickly take a note, just talk to your watch and you can take a note because OneNote is present there as well. So these are my few tips on actually building great experiences. Thank you so much, you've been an amazing audience.